Welcome to this lecture on the basic principles of dynamic material flow analysis. This lecture is part of the third method section of the Industrial Ecology Open Online course. We will learn about the principles of dynamic MFA models, have a look at the data sources that are available, we'll go through some examples of dynamic MFA and see how we can solve dynamic MFA models. We often talk about dynamic models and this term just means that we want to look at the model that accounts for time-dependent changes in the state of the system, where the stocks and the flows change over time. The opposite of a dynamic model is a static model or a steady-state model, where a system is in equilibrium, which means there's no change over time in the system variables. And the dynamic models that we want to look at are represented commonly by differential equations or by difference equations. The motivation for using dynamic models is also quite clear. We want to understand how the metabolism of our society can change over time and how we as humans and societies can interfere with the system to make it become more resource efficient or even broader, more sustainable. And therefore, we need to understand the dynamics of the system, as we usually say. We need to understand how stocks and flows change over time and how they depend on each other. Writing down dynamic MFA is quite simple. We take the standard MFA system definition where the processes, stocks and flows and just add a time dimension. So all the flows and all the stocks are now a time series where we have one value for each time step rather than just a single value. And also it means that the time frame of the system is now not a single year or a single time period but in a range of years. And we can go through now the definition of the basic MFA terms and everywhere we have a time dependency we just add the time dimension. So here we have the years Z1 to Z2 as a time frame where we quantify the system. We have the stocks changing over time or being dependent on the time and so the stock changes and the flows and also the parameter now can be time dependent. For example this K here which is a linear function starting at a base value and then slightly increasing over time. Also this is possible. We can write down the mass balance equations and now the mass balances hold for every single model here. That means we can now for example this mass balance equation for process 2 not just write down for one year but for all the years in the time period of our model and of course the mass balance have to hold for every single year. Performance indicators, like the efficiency measures that we define from our system, are now also time dependent. So they can change over time. The efficiency over time is the flow one over time divided by the other flow over time. And it can be more efficient in one year and less efficient than the other year. There's a number of data sources that we can use for conducting dynamic MFA studies. Probably one of the best data sources are the industry associations that provide us with production data and waste flows on bulk materials and specialty materials. Here on the right side you see an example of the World Plastics production supplied by Plastics Europe, where you can see the time series back dating back to the 1950s of total plastic output and plastic output in Europe. We also have the UN statistics supplying us with trade data and production data, Eurostat doing the same for European countries, the International Energy Agency for energy data, of course the scientific literature that mainly supplies process inventories and stock estimates, and we have the national statistical offices, often with data on production and waste, and also NGO reports. So what can we do with these data? Here's an example of a study conducted by Daniel Müller, who quantified the iron stocks in the US in different compartments. The big red part here is the iron in the lithosphere, so in iron ores, and the green one is the iron that's actually in use. And then you have iron accumulated in landfills, in tailing ponds, and in obsolete stocks in exports. So you can see that the overall iron stock in the US has been increasing over time because the US is a net importer of iron, and also the use phase stock has been expanding over time, but it's still it's quite significant, but not as big as the remaining reserve base that we have. We can also have a deeper look into the future of mining. Here is an example by colleagues from Monash University looking into the future of copper mining, where we can see what the mining depletion rates in different world regions may be and how 
the currently available resources will get depleted over the 21st century. And of course, this is a quite significant and policy relevant information. We can look at countries that currently build up their stocks like China, where we can assume that the Chinese per capita stock will follow a similar pattern than what we have observed in the US. Then with slightly decreasing population in the future, we can see that the total stock in gigatons may have such a shape. And from this stock curve, we can then infer what the inflows must be to build and maintain such stocks and how the outflows may look like. And this means we can use the idea that we have a certain scenario for materials, material use, to derive then a production pattern that we then can use as an industry and resource policy planning tool. We can also trace the fate of materials over time. Here is an example from Japanese colleagues from Waseda University, where we take a product that is put into stock in the starting year, and then we can here see that this initial stock slowly decays over time. So the red one here would be vehicle application and the material in there will be recycled or one can say cascaded or downcycled into construction steel, which decays slower because it has a longer lifetime, but ultimately also there will be significant refinery and recovery losses. Let's now have a look at the mathematical tools to solve dynamic MFA models to actually compute the results we have just seen. The first approach is using linear difference equations. In a difference equation, the time of the model is discrete, for example, going a step of one year. And then we can say that the current state of the system arrival is a function of the state of the system arrivals in the previous years. And in the linear case, this function would be a linear combination. So we could say that the present state is one factor times the previous year, maybe another factor times two years ago, and so on. And here we want to just have a look at the simple example for a difference equation. This is a model that contains a growth and demand of a certain system variable, a certain flow. So we say that the flow B, the consumption flow, is proportional to the flow B of the last year and the proportionality factor is 1 plus alpha. So maybe 110% or 105%. So every year the flow B is a bit bigger than the flow of the last year. And we want to apply a simple lifetime model where the lifetime is fixed, meaning a fixed number of years, and the lifetime should be capital T years, so five years or seven years. And then the outflow, the outflow D here is a fraction of the consumption from capital T years ago. So how do we go about writing down and solving the system equation? The first thing we do is we write down the equation we have and we add additional information, additional constraints, and this is of course the mass balance equations. What we also need is to identify the starting values. And the starting values here are that at certain time zero, there was a capital B for the inflow, so the starting point, and before that there were no flows. And then in this case, we can step by step manually compute the model solution. The first thing we do is we calculate the inflow B by applying its definition equation recursively so that we can then identify that 1 plus alpha to the power of T times B is the actual inflow in year T. So this is the growth factor of every year applied subsequently and then finally to the B inflow. From B we can get D via the defining equation. It's just the flow B from T, capital T years earlier. We can use the mass balance of process one to calculate the inflow A. We can use the mass balance of process two to calculate the outflow C. And from the mass balance, we also get the stock, which is the sum of the inflows B of the last capital T years. This is just a consequence of the simple lifetime model we have. Another approach is to use a continuous time in our system and then use differential equations. Differential equations are equations where the derivatives of the stocks and flows are variables. Quite well known example of a differential equation is the so called exponential decay. This is an equation where the change rate of a system variable is proportional to the variable itself. And a typical solution 
of this equation is the exponential function where the system variable over time is an initial value times e to the minus gamma t where gamma is the proportionality factor and we can call gamma also the growth rate or the decay rate depending on whether it's positive or negative. If gamma is negative we have an exponential decline that would be an example for example where we have a stock as zero slowly decaying over time with a factor e to the minus gamma t and this is what we call the leaching model for example the stock of a pollutant in a landfill or in an ecosystem that is slowly decaying is slowly degraded and then declines an exponential growth can be applied to an inflow for example where we have exponentially increasing consumption of a commodity and the functional relationship would then look like this example here. When visualizing exponential growth and decay we arrive at the following picture. In the upper half of the figure you see exponential growth curves of different growth rates 2% per year, 4% per year and so on. And in the lower half we have exponential decay or decline with the same growth rates just with opposite sign so then of course we don't call them growth rates we would call them decline or decay rates. Another important example of growth in ecosystems or society is the so-called logistic equation. In the logistic equation we want to fix the major flaw of exponential growth which is its unboundedness. The exponential growth continues forever until we stop the model or the system crashes but we would like to include the carrying capacity of the system so the capacity it actually can support into the equation. And this can be done with the following example. Here the change rate of the stock is proportional to the stock itself but then there's an additional factor and what one could say an inverse factor or a counteracting growth factor of 1 minus s. And a solution of this equation is for example the following one that you can check if you just insert this equation into the differential equation again. It is 1 over 1 plus e to the minus t and this function has the following shape here. It is a so-called S-shaped curve which has two asymptotes, one for minus infinity and the other one for plus infinity. We can modify this equation a little bit by scaling the factor for the stock and then we have a carrying capacity of C. C is the asymptotal value of these curves. We have an inflection point which is also the point of maximal growth and then we have a function that slowly grows then has a maximum growth and then levels off as the stock reaches the carrying capacity. We can also directly read the carrying capacity from this equation without having to solve it. The carrying capacity is reached when the derivative flattens out again so it becomes zero again and this is the case when this term here becomes zero and this means is the case when s equals c. The um, leveling off of stocks or other system rivals is not just a theoretical case. We can actually observe it. Here's an example of the work of Daniel Müller who investigated the steel stocks in society in different countries. For example for the US they found that there has been a time of rapid growth, especially after World War II, but there was a leveling off after the oil crisis and this leveling off has led to a steady state of the per capita steel stocks in the US and also some other developed countries over the last 20 to 30 years. So when we have such a saturation phenomenon, we can say that there is no more change over time, the per capita stocks stay constant and then we would call the system a stationary system or we say the system has reached a stationary state. With that I want to close the lecture.